Okay, I'm going to go with a number 24 font times New Roman. Um, what should I call this? The end times truth movement. And after I'm done with that, I go to number 12 font, push enter three times, go to the left, justified. Oh, how you doing? Um, actually going to do the um, sermon notes for a sermon here, and I got to thinking about it, and I thought, you know, uh, I had a request different times I've had requests uh, how do you write sermons how do you put together sermons and uh, you know I, I've given suggestions and things ways to do it but I thought you know I've never actually shown how it's done so I had this kind of an interesting idea I th and I don't know how this is going to work out this is the first time I've ever done this um, but I thought instead of me actually sitting down here and doing my study and writing out the notes uh, and then taking the notes and turning that into a sermon, I thought, I think this time, just this once, I'm not going to do this all the time because it might get kind of confusing. I don't know how this is going to go, but I thought just this once I'm going to actually sit down and film the notes being written. You're not going to see the computer screen, you know, I'm just going to be typing and things. Basically, I just have uh, Open Office. I like Open Office. I'm not really too much of a fan of Microsoft Word. It's, I just... I don't like it. I've used I use that for years, but the Open Office program I really really like. It's a free uh, software and things you can get it online, and uh, just really like it. So I have an Open Office document, and what I was saying there is I I go with number 24 font and I I do a center justify. So I have my title in the front. See if I have a sermon notes I can yeah like this. Let me let me just show you here. I don't have my overhead camera hooked up today. I'll just show you like this. See. So you have number 24 font there, center, justified, you know, in the center there, goes in the center. And then I, after I'm done with that, I go to number 12 font, which is what you see here. And then I actually take it over so it, it lines up with the left margin there. And then I type it this way. Okay, so that's the way I do it. And it just, you know, it's not, I'm not saying that this system is the only system that you can... You know, the, the Bible doctrine of center alignment and uh, sermon layout or something. No, <laughs> you know, do whatever works for you. I mean, you, of course, you don't even need to really use a computer. I mean, you can write notes out by hand. I, I've done that as well. Sometimes, you know, you aren't around a computer. You know, you're at a place that doesn't have computers or whatever, not, or your computer's not with you. And you can always rely on a concordance, strongest concordance, and... Uh, uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary for your definitions of certain words if you need that. I don't always use that either. And of course your King James Bible, which I usually use this one. This is my main preaching Bible. I've had this one for many years now. It's got a lot of notes in it and things like that. So, we're going to attempt to do this. I'm not sure how this is going to go. It's just going to be a, a simple study, um, more detailed studies that require a lot of research, a lot of quotations or video clips or photos or whatever else. That's a whole other thing. That can take me a couple days to put together something like that. So this study is just going to be a, a simple study on the end times truth movement. Okay, um, the, There are many people, myself included, that you've just had this, you know, and I, I think most of you can attest to this, that just in a few short years, you've learned more than you had learned in your whole previous life. I mean, you can, you can get saved now and you can literally go beyond the level of PhD, you know, Bible college seminary trained men within a couple months, even if you're really dedicated to studying videos and online and stuff like that. I mean, it's, you can learn a lot very quickly. And I say that you can go beyond the level of PhDs, by the way, because I've talked to PhD trained men. And uh, a lot of them don't know the Bible very well. But, um, you know, they spend too much time studying uh, systematic theology and all these other, you know, you got to come up with the big words to lord over the people. But, uh, you know, one of the ways that I will do a sermon, one of the ways the Lord will start to kind of inspire me to to preach a sermon is 
we'll be reading or discussing, my wife and I will be having a discussion, and we'll bring up a certain verse or we'll have something happen. We'll be at the store and we'll see something and we'll, and we'll be talking about it and we'll bring up a scripture. And I'll start to think about that scripture. I'll meditate on the Word of God, you know, and I don't mean I'm sitting cross-legged with my fingers doing 666 or something like that. And no, 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 no. That's not the kind of meditation that you read about in the book of Psalms. When you meditate upon the Word of God, you think about a verse and you, and you don't just, you know, you don't just read over it and say, oh yeah, that's what it means. You, you actually start to think about the words themselves and you say, how does that match what, you know what's going on right now and so I'll take a verse like that and a lot of times the Lord will show me something pretty profound through that and he'll you know re relate to something I've just gone through relate to something that's going on in the world and then it's kind of like oh, you know what that lines up with this other verse and that lines up with that verse and this could oh you could say this about it and you could say that and boy it's you know and pretty soon you start having a message being formed and again, you know, don't don't get frustrated if you're newly saved and you're like, well, I've never experienced that. Well, you know, it takes a little bit of time. Okay, I studied for over 10 years before I even started out in ministry. So, and I'm talking, you know, full-time studying, you know, with with being self-employed at the time, I was I was spending a lot of hours studying the Word of God. So, it, you know, it, it comes in time. Uh, don't get frustrated if you haven't experienced this yet. But um, the verse I got to thinking about here because I've seen so many people coming to this ministry. I've seen a lot of people and they're just like, you know, they they really know the Bible well and it's, you know, I've contacted many people and they'll say I say, you know, how long have you been saved? Oh, for about 3 months now. And I'm going, 3 months? You've only been saved for 3 months and yet, you know, writing back and forth with these people, it's like I've known people that have gone to church, you know, quote unquote church. They've gone there all their lives and they don't know the Bible as well as people that are saved two or three months. And you know, and I'm not saying that from a pride thing, I'm trying to puff people up, it's, it's not like that. And you know, I got to thinking about this and I thought, you know, it's almost as if the Lord is, as one final warning to people, He's saying, I'm going to make the truth available before the catching away of the body of Christ. Before that, I mean, I'm giving you one final warning here an outpouring of truth before the church age ends and the rapture and then the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, it's, I, I really believe that, that, that God right now in His grace and His mercy, He's saying, hey, my judgment's coming and if you want out, here's the truth. Because it's the truth that gets you saved. So we're going to go here and, uh, you know, I use a sword searcher. I know that there's some free software out there online. If any of you know about some free software for those, you know, some brethren, you know, they, I've had a guy that said to me the one time, you know, I can't afford sur sword searcher, you know, so this is a free program or whatever. If, if any of you know of anything like that, put it down in the comment section for brothers and sisters in Christ that don't have the money to buy sword searcher or that don't just want something free that they can put on their computer. Uh, so go ahead and put them down there in the, in the comment section. But uh, I go to Sword Searcher. Well, I don't really need to go to Sword Searcher. But if I, if you have a verse in your mind that you're thinking, well, I know, I don't know where it's at, but I know a couple words of it. You know, you can either use your concordance or you can use a online kind of a Bible software thing. But I know that this verse is in the book of Daniel. So you can turn in your Bible to Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Okay. Daniel 12, verse 4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. That's the verse that came to me here past week, and I was, I was really meditating on that scripture, the thing of knowledge being increased uh, in these last days. So then what I'll do is, when I'm making a sermon, I'll look at that verse and I'll say, okay, and I'll go up to verse 1. I'll go to the beginning of the chapter and I say, okay, now, and I'll start reading down through the chapter and I say, now, is this, is this going to help out with the sermon, the topic, or is this going to kind of lead away from the topic? Because you can't, you know, I found a verse in chapter 12 and one over here in Matthew chapter 3, so I'm just going to read those entire chapters. That doesn't always work. 
And it's not about, you know, picking and choosing certain verses and ignoring the rest. That's not what we're doing here. It's when you have a topic, you have to stick to your topic. And so you look and you say, what's the context? Am I taking this verse out of context? And you look and you say, no, it's, you know, the verse is right there. It, it lines up and everything. So you put the verse into your study. And so what I'll do is I'll have, I'll highlight, you know, or make bold the scripture reference. I'll have Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. And then I usually do three spaces with my space bar thing. I have weird ways. Of, you know, you don't have to do it this way. but um, And then I push, you know, I take off the, the bold thing so it's just regular plain text. And then what I'll do is I'll write a little note in my sermon notes here saying, you know, the point is of this verse, knowledge shall be increased. And knowledge certainly has increased. So I'll just say... Um, uh, knowledge has increased. Okay, and then I'll I'll push enter two times and go down and be ready for the next scripture reference. But you know, my point is here with this scripture: has this thing come true? This verse here. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. And there's a whole lot of things that can be said about this. And again, you know, as you're doing a sermon, the Lord will start to give you these ideas. And there's probably some of you out there that are like, oh man, I'd like to say some things on this verse. Very good verse for these last times. So you can write these things into your notes or, you know, just as the Lord leads, as the Lord's telling you what to say, just put down the scriptures and go there and then just whatever the Lord tells you to say with that thing. But, you know, on this note, it's very interesting. It says there, seal the book even to the time of the end. What happens? When is the book unsealed? In the book of Revelation. Chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. After John's caught up, you know, to heaven there. Uh, not going to get into all that. If you know the channel, you know what I'm talking about there. But the book is unsealed in the end times. Now, when you read about the events of the book of Revelation, you read about world wars and you, you read about uh, all these other things happening and, and stuff and the, the, a mark in the right hand or in the forehead, you know, a lot of people in the past would not have understood that. A lot of people would have been like, huh? How can you have, how can you control buying and selling worldwide? First of all, how are you going to do that? How can you have a government do that back in 1600, you know, in the Vatican? course but they didn't have total control um, back then and they don't now because we're still here body Christ is still here but you know you look at this thing and you say you know people in the past they would have been like this doesn't really make any sense why the book was sealed until the time of the end now we are in the time of the end so all of a sudden it's just like the the floodgates of truth have opened up and all this information is coming out and I mean, it's just, it's insane. I mean, I just like I got on the internet the other day to, to Net Zero. I have, I use them for my email and they're on the main page. Uh, Spain had a, a lottery and the winning number was, the, the winning amount that you could win was $666 million. I mean, it's just everywhere. 666, everything, just all over the place. You know, it's just incredible. They're just putting 666 out there, just, just all throughout society. What's going on? We are in the end times. The book is being unsealed. You know? And on that note, too, it's kind of interesting because you have this big thing, the big argument against the preacher rapture. They say, well, it wasn't taught until 1830. Okay, now, first of all, that's not true. There have been multiple quotations in the early church fathers, and I don't recommend them for anything. Okay, they're just, you know, they were very weak doctrinally. But the point is, there were church fathers that talked about a pre-trib rapture. Okay, now not the term pre-trib rapture, you know, but the point is it was a it was a you know it was a known about thing way, way back there. Okay, so again, they don't prove anything there. But let's just go with this philosophy for one minute here. The pre-trib rapture is a recent doctrine. Well, the Bible says right there that this book is going to be sealed until the end times. 
So let's just say that there's never a quote about the pre-trib rapture before 1830. There was, but let's just go with this argument. Well, uh, wouldn't that be consistent with this verse here in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4? The book is sealed until the time of the end. Now, all of a sudden, we can look at the Bible and we can exposit it and we can say, well, obviously there's a pre-trib rapture. You know, you compare things, scriptural things together and stuff like this. And, and the body of Christ is a different dispensation than what's going on in Matthew chapter 24. You can look and you can say, them which be in Judea, you know, uh, you know, all the other thing about the Sabbath day and all this other stuff. See? You know, you compare these things. Now we can see it. Now we can understand. I mean, go again, go back to the year 1700 and say to people, hey, you know, think of Israel. Boy, war sure is getting bad over in Israel right now. They'd be like, what do you mean Israel? I know Israel, there's a geographic area where Israel used to be, but there's no nation of Israel. Year 1800, say the same thing. The year 1900, say the same thing. 1949, a year after the, uh, well, depending on when you would be, 1948 is when Israel became a nation again. See? So, now we can see these things. Now the scriptures are starting to be unlocked. They're being unsealed here in the time of the end. But, uh, you know, interesting too there, money, many shall run to and fro. Uh, you know, there you have the thing of transportation. You have the thing of people driving around and going places and things. And knowledge shall be increased. So, Again, like I'm saying, we're seeing that time period now. But uh, look at verse 9 of the same chapter there. And here again, you know, I'll say, okay, I'm going to the same chapter, so I'll go back. I'll write down Daniel chapter 12, verse 9. And see, now here I would read a couple verses. And, you know, I'm, I re I'm realizing here very quickly I'm not going to be able to do everything like I would a normal study because it you'd be sitting here for hours watching me and <laughs> I don't think you really want to do that but um, I'm looking here and I'm, I'm saying okay I think verses 9 and 10 would be good so I just write 9 and 10 there and uh, ties in with verse 4 so let's read Daniel chapter 12 verses 9 and 10 and he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Here we are. Verse 10, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, see so again, take the verse, The wise shall understand. Who is the wise? In your Bible. Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You need wisdom to be wise, correct? So think about the key word there, wise. So you can type in your Bible, or type, excuse me, type in sword searcher, look it up in your concordance, wise. Who does the Bible say is wise? How about wisdom? What are the references to wisdom to tie into the scripture here? What about the wicked? Another key w word there within that verse, within verse 10. So you say, okay, who is the wicked? Who is the wise? And you tie it in like that. Who is God saying is wicked and who is wise? And you say, okay, well, I didn't really find anything under wicked. Okay. Then you say, what other, what would be words that would line up with wicked? Synonyms, you know, things that are, that are similar to the word wicked. Well, you would have sinner, you would have evil, you would have whatever. So again, that's another way that you can go through Scripture and put together these sermons. But let me comment on those two verses. Very interesting. Verse 9, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words, the words, are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Again, you know, all this stuff that's going on in our world today lines up perfectly with Bible prophecy, but you go back two, three hundred years ago and you tell people, I mean, do you ever think about what it'd be like to go back in a time machine? You know? And you go back and you, you take a, a, we'll just say an iPhone or something back with you, and you take it back and you show the people back uh, your, uh, we'll just say, we'll go back to uh, 1610 
all right and the the translators are walking out of the you know the room there the at uh cambridge will say the the cambridge group you know they're coming out of the room there and you say oh excuse me excuse me gentlemen and they look at you and they say oh yes what is it and you say, i'd like to show you what the future is going to be of course your iphone's not going to get a very strong signal back in 1610 but you know <laughs> My point is, you, you you know, you look and you show them the technology and you show them touching the, you know, this thing. They, they'd probably, you know, try you for witchcraft or something. They, they'd be like, you know, what is this? You know why? Well, the stuff that's going on in Bible prophecy is sealed up until the time of the end. They didn't understand it back then. Okay? So there's a lot of things. I mean, you know, you go back through church history, you're, gonna, you're not going to see a whole lot of... of uh, really good exposition of end time prophecy type scriptures. Why? Because it's sealed until the time of the end. You know? And you know, what's the name of the book of Revelation? You know, just keep your hand there in Daniel chapter 12. I want to make this point. And see, again, you can, you know, you put this into your study. But go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which which must shortly come to pass. Okay, we'll just stop there. What is this? What's this book about? It's about Jesus Christ. How God redeemed man through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, and, you know, we don't often think about this, but the revelation of Jesus Christ means that Jesus Christ is going to be physically revealed to the world. I mean, this is a weird thought, right? And we and there's so much that we don't even think about, you know, and just take it literally. But the fact is, the world could literally know who Jesus Christ is. I mean, the world could be in the millennial kingdom in 10 years. Isn't that weird? I mean, that's that's some pretty crazy thoughts. And in just a few years, people could know who Jesus Christ is. Why? The book's going to be revealed. The revelation of Jesus Christ happens in the end times. And this stuff people didn't understand 200 years ago, now we understand it. And right now, God's mercy is saying, hey, I'm going to give you that opportunity there, that little narrow window of opportunity where you can get out of my wrath that's coming, my judgment that's coming on this world. And you say, why don't people do it? Well, verse 10 there in Daniel chapter 12. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. Okay, let me just say this real quick too. How do you get purified and made white as a Christian? Right now, you're purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you're made white, whiter than snow, actually. And tried. Now, you are tried and tempted as a Christian, certainly. And it's just part of the thing of, of God oftentimes using temptations and trials to, to help you become a stronger Christian and uh, to get you through certain things. And you can learn from other people's mistakes or your own mistakes or whatever. That's what's going on there. But there's also an application to somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. They certainly are going to be tried at that point in time. And their purification comes from faith in Jesus Christ. But also now in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's the added thing of you can't take that mark of the beast. So there is an element of works. Okay, I'm not excluding Jesus Christ. Salvation by faith in Jesus Christ in the time of Jacob's trouble. That still has to be there. They still have to believe that Jesus died for their sins. But now you have this very unique thing of you can't take the mark of the beast. So you can apply verse 10 there to either, you know, right now the church age or into the time of Jacob's trouble. But interesting here, it goes on to say, But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. You know why they don't understand? Because they're wicked. It's not because they can't understand. It's because they are wicked. We're going to see a scripture tie in here in just a minute. But the wise shall understand. All right? 
Hmm. Now you say, okay, what would, you know, what would be a good tie into this whole thing? You know, how could I tie this? Okay, we're in Daniel. Now what are we going to do? Are we going to, you know, how, where do we go from here? Well, again, this is going to come as you study the Bible more, um, as you understand things and you say, okay, is there some kind of a scripture in the New Testament? Can we tie Old Testament to New Testament? Is there a scripture in the New Testament that would line up with what's going on here in the book of Daniel? Because you see that all through the New Testament, by the way. You'll see uh, in the Gospels, Jesus Christ oftentimes will quote Old Testament scriptures to prove New Testament doctrine. Paul does it. A lot of these guys are doing it. They'll quote the Old Testament to prove what's going on there in the New Testament. So it's a good practice to get into, tying Old Testament to New Testament and New Testament to Old Testament too to show the, the continuity between the two, that they line up perfectly, they mesh perfectly together. All right. So what would be a good New Testament tie-in? Well, turn in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians. Talking about the end times here. 1 Thessalonians. It's all right here. 1 Thessalonians. And we'll go to chapter 4 because this is important to re read this. Verses 16 through 18. Through 18. And I just want to cover this because while we're here in context, I want to get people to remember that there is a rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble. So again, it's it's not the exact tie into the scripture, but you go to the New Testament and you show how it builds up to the tie-in back to the book of Daniel. Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's why I talk about the rapture so much, because it is a comfort. It is a comfort to know that we're going to get out of this thing before the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Um, again, <laughs> because it is the time of Jacob's trouble. What is Jacob? Jacob is Israel. It's not the time of the church's trouble. God does not need to show us signs and wonders to verify the New Testament. You know, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Does God need to reveal Jesus Christ to you or me? No, that already happened at salvation. I've already met Jesus Christ. I don't need faith or whatever else to believe in Jesus Christ. I know him personally. Okay, I don't need to see signs and wonders, seven this and seven, you know, the seven uh, seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials. I don't need to see that stuff to be convinced that the New Testament is accurate. Who does? Israel, the Jewish people, they need to see those things. The Jews require a sign. See, it all lines up. Okay, so it's a comfort to me and to you to know that we're going to go to see Jesus Christ soon. He's going to catch us away. He's going to catch his bride away before he pours out his wrath. Okay, so you have that there. Now, what do you do? Well, let me, I forgot to write, I have the scripture reference here, and I say, um, I'll just write down to remember what I was going to say, even though I don't really have to because I'm saying it right now. I'll just write down uh, the rapture verses. And you know, it's, it's funny too. I just want to make a, a little statement about this. I was watching a video um, by Doc Marquis about the rapture. And, um, and he said about how that the word uh, rapture comes from Jerome's Latin Vulgate. There in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, these verses, uh, at some point in there it talks about uh, rapio or some kind of word in Latin. That's where we get our term rapture from. And I thought that's interesting because, you know, a lot of people say well, there was no mention of the rapture before 1830. It's like, well, that's actually not true because, you know, if you go to the Latin Vulgate there, it uses the, the Latin word for rapture. So I thought that was kind of funny. But uh, 
And I'm not saying that you know Jerome was teaching a pre-trib rapture. Okay, I'm not saying that, but it's just the word rapture was around for a long time. But uh, now let's go to First Thessalonians. So I'll write this: First Thessalonians, chapter five. Whoops. And we'll go through verse one to get into context. Um, Looking at the verses here. I have these things all marked because I've been through this passage so many times. We'll go down to verse 11. And now if you remember back in the book of Daniel, it talked about uh, the wicked shall not understand. You know, they'll do wickedly and they won't understand. But the wise will understand. We're going to see the distinction between the two here. And I'm going to write that down. I'm going to write for my little note here on the scripture. Uh, distinction... Between the wick, wicked lost and the saved, I won't say saved wise, I'll say um, between the wise saved Christians. Okay. Now, let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light. And the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Notice it's interesting there too, you know, because obviously sleep is not a sin. What about drunkenness? The wicked shall do wickedly. Continuing, verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Okay, let me stop there again. Now see, here's another interesting tie-in, because as you're reading through the verses, when you're preparing a sermon, a lot of times you'll see a key word pop out at you, and you'll be thinking already, the Lord will give you another verse in your mind that you'll say, wait a second here, that would be a good tie-in to this thing. Now see, I'm going to spoil my surprise here. Um, verse 8, but let us who are of the day. Now later on we're going to be talking about over in, uh, I think it's Second Peter chapter 1, about the day star rising in your heart, you know, the, until the day dawn, you know, day star rising in your heart. Let us who are of the day. So you go, oh yeah, there's another tie-in. I'm going to make a reference to that. So you can say, you know, write down a note on that or whatever you want or you know, go over to Second Peter chapter one here in a little bit, and then come back here when you go to the day star thing. Go back here to this one. See, the the Bible. There's so many things that tie together, and that's that's again, the Lord will show you that stuff as you're putting together a sermon. Um, let's continue here, verse nine. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep. You see that there? We should live together with Him. And again, wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. You know one of the greatest edifications that you can give to another Christian? A way to edify them, a way to encourage them? Tell them stories about soul winning. Telling stories about, hey, you know, sharing. I, one of my favorite comments to read is when I see people that have just gotten saved or whatever, and they say, or I'll get a letter, or I'll get an email, and they say, I just got saved not long ago. I found the Lord led me to your channel. I really learned a lot. Man, that's great. That's edifying me. Okay? And my comfort that I can offer in return is we aren't going to have to put up with this nutty world much longer. Okay? We're going to be leaving and then we're going to have the ultimate reunion. And we're going to get up there and there's not going to be a faction of Bible believers that don't agree with Brian Denlinger and those that are Denlingerites or something. No. I'm just going to be another Christian. We're all just going to be, I mean, we're all just brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, the Lord used this ministry, uh, I, and I thank the Lord for that to help a lot of people. Praise the Lord, whatever. Yeah.
but I'm not I'm not up on some pedestal and you'll get up there and you'll you know you'll worship me you know on one day and then you worship Jesus the other day you know good night you know <laughs> and I'm just saying that to just prove a point I don't expect people to think that way or whatever but you know my my point is we're going to be up there we're all going to be thinking the same way you know at that point in time the the areas where I'm messed up or whatever the Lord's going to straighten me out you know the areas where you're messed up the Lord will straighten you out too you know it's going to be wonderful it's a comfort our job down here on this earth is hey comfort each other as bad as things are getting right now as bad as things look out there on the horizon we're going man i can't just I mean, this is so bad we're like right on the brink of war the economy's falling apart this is happening i mean the, the, the weird climate stuff i mean just the other other day it was it was 40 degrees below zero fahrenheit here and i remarked uh, to my wife i said i said isn't it amazing this room that i'm in right here it was 68 degrees and i said it's 68 degrees here and just a couple feet that way right out through the wall there outside it's 40 degrees below zero i said that's 108 degrees difference within a few feet it's amazing right now it's it's like hovering right around zero degrees fahrenheit out there and in, in, I think two days from now, it's supposed to be 42 degrees above zero and raining. It's like, huh? <laughs> you know, weird weather, weird, weird, weird stuff. And of course, you know, there's all kinds of things, geoengineering and HARP and all this other stuff. The scientists are crazy. They're messing around with things, whatever other subject there. But again, you know, you can look at all this stuff. It starts to get overwhelming. And, I, you know, I just want to say this, too. I understand the thing of post-trib people more than a lot of them, I think, you know, realize that I do. And, and that is because I understand it gets frustrating and you start to think to yourself, what if Jesus doesn't come back? What if we do go into the time of Jacob's trouble? You know, and you start to, you start to fear, you know, you start to get afraid. And the reason for that is because you're, you're losing sight of what you know, what the Bible says about the Lord and, and God's character. I mean, show me in the play, in the Bible any place where God judged the wicked, or excuse me, judged the saved, the righteous, along with the wicked. Show me that where God specifically pours out His wrath on people that aren't doing anything wrong. Show me that. And you know, I know none are without sin. Don't even say, oh, you're sinless. It's a big difference between, you know, uh, being sinless and, and, you know, I, I mean, we're not, I'm not like living in, in total wicked sin or anything. A lot of you aren't either. You know, yes, I still struggle with sin. I understand that. I'm not sinlessly perfect. But for God to judge me the same way that he's going to judge the sodomites out there and all the other people, the Satanists and the witches and, and hardcore Roman Catholics and whatever else, why would a just God do that? You know, and, and that's what the time of Jacob's trouble is too, by the way. It's God's judgment, God's wrath from the very beginning, you know. But, okay, getting back to our study here. Uh, See, so, you know, this is why I'm not going to do it this way a lot because this is kind of a disorganized thing. And I usually like to have my notes and whatever else, but like I said, I thought I'd do an interesting study this time. Um, so now, what would be another good place to go to? The wicked shall do wickedly, and the wise shall understand. Second Thessalonians. So we'll go. Whoops. Second Thessalonians, chapter two. And of course, I'd say go down to verse ten. I'm just looking to where to read to. Ten through verse seventeen looks like is what we want to read. I'm going to write as my note ties in perfectly with Daniel twelve nine through ten. Okay, so we have another scripture reference here. But let's go. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter two verse ten through seventeen. 
and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Ooh, right there. See how that ties in with Daniel chapter 12, verse 10? The wicked shall do wickedly and shall not understand. You see? You get that there? That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. They don't understand. But had pleasure in unrighteousness. The wicked doing wickedly. You know why there's so many atheists and so many people that hate the Bible and mock the Bible? Because they're doing wickedly. They don't want to believe in God because that will ruin their fun. That's what's going on there. Continue, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Okay? Paul writing here. If you are a Christian, you need to hold fast to the things that you've learned mainly through the Pauline epistles. Now, I'm not hyper-dispensationalist. I'm not saying ignore the Gospels, ignore anything that Paul didn't write. I'm not saying that. But you have to remember the, the majority of our doctrine for you as a Christian today comes from the Pauline epistles. And you can get really messed up if you ignore the Pauline epistles and you go back to the Sermon on the Mount try to live that way, or you try to go to James chapter 2 with faith and works and stuff, and you can get really, really, really messed up. Or go back to the Old Testament and try to pretend that you're Jewish and that you're going to live under the law and all this stuff. Bad news. But uh, verse 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts... And establish you in every good word and work. Again, we're back to the thing of wherefore comfort yourselves. Comfort yourself. Comfort, comfort, comfort. Okay? Understand. I mean, let, let me say it this way, okay? After the Vietnam War, there were over 2,000 soldiers that were MIA POW, missing in action, prisoner of war. All right? And... Our government, I mean, you can study this thing out. Basically what happened is the North Vietnamese said, you, we want a, you to pay us reparations and, you know, to fix up our country that you tore up over here with your war that you brought against us, and we'll give you your soldiers back. And our government said, no, keep the soldiers. And that's what happened. And, of course, the CIA was in there dealing drugs and a bunch of other stuff. The whole Golden Triangle thing, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, I think it is, they were growing heroin and all this other stuff. It was a CIA war. But, um, you know, they, there was, you know, a lot of political stuff going on with the thing of why the prisoners of war were left over there and the missing in action guys, which, you know, missing in action means that you just, something happened to you during the war. You could have, they could have been taken captive or they could have been blown to pieces and they just never found them or whatever. But it was all political scheming. And those soldiers, over 2,000 soldiers, were left behind by our government when our government pulled out, pulled the troops out of Vietnam. Now, if you could go to those soldiers and say to them, um, before they'd gone over there, uh, when you sign up for go to the military here, when you sign up and you go over to war, um, you're going to get captured and after the war ends, the government, because of political scheming, is going to leave you there with the enemy. Who wants to join? Who wants to join the military? Uh, not too many people are going to join a military like that. That'll leave you behind. You say, what point are you trying to make? Well, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, and see, let me just stop there for a minute, uh, too, here. God will give you these little stories and things like that that you read. I've read a lot of books, so you know, the Lord will give me little tie-ins like that. And, of course, as a researcher, I learn things there, too. So you can use stories from your life, stories from things that you've read to illustrate points in the Bible. Okay, just want to put that in, in there, too, as we're talking about doing these sermons. 
But my point I'm trying to make is, it's a comfort to me to know that the army that I joined, this, I'm a soldier of Jesus Christ, and my commanding officer is not going to let me fall into the hands of the enemy, and it, the enemy there being himself, because it's God that pours out his wrath on the earth that's coming. Now, I might be taken by Jesuits and taken off to some place and tortured, or I might be taken by Homeland Security or some other, you know, terrorist organization, some kind of bad thing, and, and you know, uh, we need to psychoanalyze this guy because he's crazy and he's causing problems and whatever else. That might happen, okay? But we're not talking about that in the book of Revelation. It's not the Illuminati that's bringing in the, the New World Order and all this other stuff. It's God, His judgment. He's the one that unseals that first seal and the Antichrist is unleashed and goes forth conquering and to conquer, Revelation chapter 6. He is the one that allows this one world government to be built. Why? Let's go back to the beginning here. What do we say about the book of Revelation? The revelation of Jesus Christ. To who? The nation of Israel. The Jews require a sign. You see how it all ties together? And so, you know, what's happening here is you see this thing of the body of Christ, it's supposed to be a comfort to us. We're supposed to comfort each other and remind each other, hey, all this bad stuff that you can see out there on the horizon, all the 666 and all the one world government and the wars and everything else that's going to come soon to this earth and all the, the you know, uh, environmental catastrophe that's happening and the financial collapse and all this other stuff, solar flares and everything. All that stuff is going to come. It is going to happen. But the comfort is you don't have to worry about it as a Christian because God is going to pull you out before that thing happens, before He pours out His wrath. Now, we might have problems from the world. We might have evil governments coming after us and things like that and hurting Christians. That might be there. And, of course, you have Christians in other countries that are going through some really bad stuff right now. But they are not going through God's judgment. They're not going through God's wrath. Okay? And as specifically written in the, in the time of Jacob's trouble, the book of Revelation there. Okay, I should mention that because there are some nations that God are under God's judgment and that's why there's bad stuff happening. But what I'm saying is the events of the book of Revelation have not happened yet and they will not happen until the body of Christ has been removed. I mean, we are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And he's going to pour out judgment on himself. It's not even logical. It doesn't even make any sense. Okay? But another interesting point I want to make here, too, about this passage. You know, you see this thing again of receiving the love of the truth and you get out. Now, uh, you know, again, I find it very interesting that you have so many people who profess to be Christians and yet they hate the truth. It's just kind of like... Uh, how does that work out? You know, I'm a Christian, but I hate truth. And, you know, I don't say that people have to be 100% understanding everything. I mean, you're going to be at different levels along your journey. You're, you're that level of sanctification there. What would we read, read there? Um, verse 13, uh, the second part of it says, Because God hath from the beginning, the beginning of what? Oh, the beginning of the world, you know, you're predestinated. No, 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 no the beginning of your salvation, when you got saved, chosen you to salvation, see there's your salvation, through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. When you are truly saved, you will have the sanctification, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, the work of setting you apart, of showing you things that the world isn't going to understand, and belief of the truth. That must be there. And when I see people who profess to be Christians and they're off on so many different important doctrinal stands, I start going, I just don't really want to call that person saved and give them a false sense of salvation. Okay, I don't want to give somebody comfort that shouldn't have comfort, in other words. I want to make sure that, hey, make sure you're saved. Be sure that you're ready to leave because you don't want to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. So, um, just trying to think. Oh, I know where it was we were going to go. I mentioned it earlier. Now, the next place we'll go to, 
you see there again you know just to tie up what we were saying there um, you see there the thing about belief of the truth the wise understanding if you go back to the book of Daniel and the end times there's a, a tremendous pouring out of truth so let's go we were t just my wife and I were talking about this today we, at uh, while we were eating breakfast we were talking about this uh, second Peter chapter 1 so let me write that down here second Peter 1 Verses 19 through 21, is it? Yeah, 21. More key scriptures. Um, I'm going to write key scriptures about prof prophecy. Okay, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You know, it was funny because we were talking and my wife, she said, um, you know, it just dawned on me. And she went talking, and, and I was like, just dawned on me. Just dawned on me. And I got to think about that. I thought, you know, isn't that interesting? Let us who are of the day be sober. It talks about back there in First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're of the day. We're not of the night. We don't sleep as do others. We're aware. We are in the light. We walk in the light. It says about over in First John chapter 1. Us who are of the day until the day dawn. It just dawned on me. I thought that's a rather interesting expression that we have in our English language. This just dawned on me. Verse 19. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Hmm. I thought, that's rather interesting. <laughs> you know, here we are and the day is dawning. The revelation of Jesus Christ is a very short time away. Just, I don't even know. I, you know, I'm not, I'd like to make a prediction. I wish, you know, the Lord would tell me sometimes, but He's not about to, because uh, it's just not recorded in Scripture, and so it's just supposed to be a mystery. But you know, we're very close. I mean, it could be months. It could be a few years. It's not going to be another twenty or thirty years or something like that. I mean, we're we are like on the doorstep of the time of Jacob's trouble. And the rapture has to happen before that. So, I mean, we're getting real, really, really, really close. And you say, what's going on? Well, the day is dawning. You see, we've been in darkness now for a long time. And that day is now starting to dawn. The sun is starting to come up. And what happens when the day dawns? More truth. Knowledge shall be increased. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the truth. John chapter 14, verse 6. Again, another tie-in. You could write that down in your notes there if you want to. I'm not going to include it in mine because you can just quote Scripture too. That's fine. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So you see the truth. And as Jesus Christ is starting to approach the earth, it's just like the sunlight's getting brighter. The light's coming on more and more and more. And there's more and more and more truth coming out all the time. And I've illustrated this point too, you know. Get my little pocket flashlight out here. Here's a little flashlight right here. Now, let me turn it on. Do you see any light coming from it? No. You know why? Because there's a lot of light on in here. But as it gets darker, and I'm not going to—I can't do this right now. I'm not going to shut off my studio lights, and I can't shut off the light outside. <laughs> Don't have the op option for that. But if I take this light and go down like this. You see, it gets a whole lot brighter. And in a very similar way, uh, as things get darker and darker in this world, our light as Christians is getting brighter. Jesus Christ is coming back. You see that seal, the book that's sealed up, you can read about it in Revelation chapter 5, Jesus Christ is the one that unseals the book. And so we have this extreme time of truth 
that's coming. Okay, now doing a sermon, you can go there and you can. There's, I mean, there's so many way, different things we can go to, and I, I just have to keep kind of keep this thing somewhat to a minimum here because doing the sermon this way is kind of odd. But I just thought I'd do it. Now, see, I can end it with an exhortation to Christians. But you see, I feel more and more like, you know, I know that there are lost people that watch my videos, people that don't know Jesus Christ, and they're still, they're seeing elements of the truth. They're starting to see that bright light coming. They're starting to see, wow, there's some really weird stuff going on in the world, and they're looking for answers. They're looking for truth. And that's why a lot of times I'm trying to end my sermons with little exhortations to my brothers and sisters in Christ, yes. But also... I'm trying to convict you out there if you're lost and get you to realize this stuff that we're seeing in our world is confirming the Bible, both Old and New Testaments too, by the way. It's confirming Scripture. And your chance to get saved is the easy way, you know, right now through Jesus Christ, faith alone. You know, that chance to get saved is getting, it's starting to go like this. You better do it quick. Because I'm going to show you here, Another scripture that the Lord kind of gave me as I was thinking about doing this study. Go back to your Old Testament, to the book of Amos. So I'll write this one down too. We have Amos. Whoops. Amos chapter 8. Okay, I'm just going to read verses 11 through 12. And for a note, I'm going to write, What will happen after the rapture? Exclamation mark, not a question mark. Because I know what's going to happen after the rapture. This is it right here. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. When the body of Christ leaves, there aren't going to be too many preachers left on the earth. <laughs> Okay, and the ones that are left on the earth are the ones that aren't that didn't receive the love of the truth. Okay, um, the body of Christ is here right now, and you can learn a lot from the body of Christ. And when we leave, I believe this that this book here, this King James Bible, is going to be considered hate literature because this will be our the manual of the crazy people that that did the terrible terrorist thing, you know. When the rapture happens, you know, when we leave, it's going to look, you know, the people, they'll just, the media can spin it and turn it into a, uh, you know, terrorist attack or something like that. I mean, it's going to be totally random. It's going to be all over the place, all over the world. And it's just going to be a couple million people. I don't know how many exactly are in the body of Christ right now, but a couple million people leaving. Um, the graves, I believe, are going to be open of the saints that, that slept, you know, which is really going to weird people out too. <laughs> And I do believe that the babies, all babies, you know, all small children under that age of accountability, uh, and lo the Lord knows what that age is. I can't give an exact age. But all babies and really small children are going to be leaving with us. I do believe that. So it's going to be chaos. And also there's a theory, too, uh, which, you know, the, the question comes up, and I was going to actually do a pre-trib rapture moment on this, and I might still in the future get into more of the scriptures behind it. But the, theory, the, the question, I should say, of what will be left behind at the rapture. In other words, if I was raptured right now, would everything just disappear? Because I've heard some brethren, they say, well, I think that, you know, it's just going to be your body is going to be left. You know, it'll just be like this, you know, and they'll come in, they'll find my body, and I'll, be, I'll look like I'm dead. Well, I don't believe that. I believe that the body is actually going to be leaving as well. It's, you know, it's kind of like Enoch in the Old Testament. He was not found, okay? So, you know, uh, or, or I guess it says he was not for God took him. You know, I don't think it says he was not found, but, you know, he was not for God took him. And so I do believe that we're going to be leaving and disappearing. But um, I know uh, Dr. Ruckman has a theory that uh, we are going to basically imitate what Jesus Christ 
when, or, or, or you know, we're going to be like Christ in terms of when he left. And what did Jesus Christ leave? Clothes and blood was all that was left there, you know, and, and you know, he shed his blood on the cross and his clothes were left behind there in the tomb, you know. And so, you know, it's a theory. And, and again, I can't be super dogmatic. I'm not teaching this stuff as doctrine. It's just kind of interesting. Don't really know for sure. But I think that at the rapture, if you want my honest opinion, and it is an opinion, I'll state that. I'm not teaching this as doctrine. My honest opinion is that what will be left behind is our clothing, glasses, you know, ring if you wear one, or a watch, or wallet, keys to your vehicle, whatever, your shoes, is going to be left behind along with the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And you read about in, you know, uh, again, like I said, this is, I'm, I don't want to get into the big study right now, but there's there are verses that talk about, you know, uh, that, that point towards a resurrection body not having blood in them. Uh, the book of Joel, chapter 2, I think it is, the army that comes back with Jesus Christ, which I take to be the saints that come back with Jesus, the saved Christians, they can fall on a sword and not be hurt. Uh, well, if you don't have blood in your veins, you could do that. You know, it wouldn't hurt you. So, very interesting. And life of the flesh is in the blood, too, you know. So, I don't know. Interesting stuff there. But, what ha what's going to happen is you're going to have the body of Christ leaving and you know if it happens the way that the theory goes that your clothes and your blood will be left behind it'll look like a bomb went off like we somehow exploded ourselves or something like this and just be like and you know it could be like an actual you know, you know like that not just and everything falls it could actually be like a little explosion a little miniature explosion and it could be you know some kind of terrible thing and, you know, I got to thinking about this, too. Um, right now, the body of Christ is worth more to these people that are putting together the New World Order, the One World Government. We're, we're more valuable to them alive than we would be dead. Okay, if they did a uh, real hot tyranny here in America and they went out and they rounded up all the Christians and they put us in camps and tortured us to death and everything, what's well, going to validate a lot of what we're saying? Okay. As far as uh, the government's getting bad and the, the you know wicked and everything else, you know because they're going to leave the modern Babel buildings, they'll leave those alone. So again, it would it would just prove that we're right and they're persecuting us and things like this. But if they let us go, and the rapture happens, say this year, a couple months from now or whatever, the rapture happens, then they can use that event and say, see, look at these terrible terroristic uh, Bible believing Bible thumpers, you know. And they can kick in all kinds of controls and things. And I believe that that's when you're going to see this thing right here coming to pass. In the book of Amos, chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Finding a good Bible-believing group to be part of, or a Bible-believing pastor at that point in time, preacher, is going to be next to impossible. And, of course, I believe that they'll probably kick in Internet 2 or something like that, and they'll shut down channels like mine, and they'll just pull the whole thing. And right now, the Lord's keeping it open, you know. And I, I just want to say this, too, real quickly. A lot of people are like, Brian, you're not being persecuted and stuff like this. You know, it's not Christian persecution, what Google's doing to you. I know that, okay. To me, persecution is, you know, people trying to threaten my life and things like that, and people screaming at me and, and whatever else and, and threatening me. That's what I would consider persecution. What I was doing is I was speaking with their own terminology, using it, spinning it against them and saying, you're persecuting me, you're intolerant, you're hateful, whatever. I don't care about that stuff, okay? I'm, I'm very politically incorrect. But I'm using their own terminology and spinning it and putting it back on them. Because they try to make us look like we're narrow-minded and bigoted. And I'm saying, look at you, you're narrow-minded and bigoted. What are you doing to my channel? See? That's why I did that. Just want to make a point about that. But, again, the verse here, you know, I believe this is going to be truly fulfilled right after the catching away of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is left. There's nobody to preach the word of God anymore. Right away, anyhow, I know 144,000, the two witnesses, I know that. But I'm saying right away there, we're gone. Preaching of the word of God is going to be very difficult to find. The Bible is going to be blamed. 
You know, you see back in the book of Revelation chapter 6, and you could do this in your study if you want to, if you were putting this thing together. Go back to Revelation chapter 6 where it talks about people being slain for the word of God. Make that tie in. We're not going to go there, but, you know, I just mentioned it there for the sake of the argument. But I believe the Bible is going to be blamed for the rapture, the King James Bible, and it's going to be rounded up and burned. I, I do believe that. And uh, if you stand for the King James Bible, if you would miss the rapture and somebody would say, oh, wow, you know, that was what my crazy relative was talking about at that point in time, um, you're going to become an enemy of the state and things. And, of course, there are there will be a great multitude that does get saved out of that time. So, very interesting things there. But um, I'm going to, I think I'm just going to, uh, call it quits here. There's so many more. I mean, I only have a couple places. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different things there that uh, different passages to go to. And of course, you know, usually I'll do two or three pages, so maybe, you know, 30, 40 different places we'll turn to in the Bible. Um, usually, I mean, uh, that's what I try to shoot for, about two to three pages of, of sermon notes. But again, it depends on what the Lord uh, wants me to do. But uh, I just thought I would like to do this, kind of kill two birds with one stone here. First of all, talk about the scripture of this end times truth movement, but also, you know, just kind of go through and, and tell some of the brethren out there, you know, how you can put together sermons, um, the, the kind of the process that you'll go through. And like I said, this, it might take you a couple days to, to work on a sermon, a good sermon like this. Um, I mean, there are so many places that you can go to in the Bible. Uh, if you have some kind of little Bible study to do or something, you have to kind of keep it short. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of ranting and raving here, uh, a lot of talking and things. Uh, you can stick more to the Scriptures and just read what the Bible says and just make a comment or two and then go to the next verse and just kind of keep things moving. Um, but again, I'm trying to, you know, my desire has always been to raise the brethren up. You know, I don't ever want to lord over people. I don't ever want to get to a point where you have to come to me for all truth and all knowledge and all understanding of Scripture or something. I mean, give me a break. You know, I want people to be able to study the Scriptures on their own and and understand the Bible. And, you know, there's a lot of brethren on, on YouTube that I respect very highly, and I don't even get along with all of them. We don't agree in all aspects and all ways and things. And we have different techniques and different, you know, whatever. That's fine. Absolutely fine. Uh, as long as you're sticking to the King James Bible, not messing around with other versions and whatever else. Whatever, you know. And, you know, and of course, I'm not trying to, to say that people that are teaching false doctrine are okay. I'm not. I'm not. But, you know, there are some, there's some flexibility with uh, certain things that you can teach and you can argue the points back and forth. You know what I'm talking about. But I just wanted to put this thing together quickly because the Lord really kind of impressed this in my, into my mind here that, you know, it's just kind of like as the revelation of Jesus Christ gets closer, it's like He's coming back and the light that emanates from Jesus Christ, i use my little flashlight thing here again to illustrate my point. You know, it's like, like this, and you see this light, and it's coming back here, you know, and you can see it's getting brighter and brighter and brighter as it's getting closer to hitting the lens, and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter, you know. See, the closer it's getting, the, the brighter the light. And as a result, when Jesus Christ comes back, back you know, at the second coming, there is not going to be any more error or lies or deceit at that point in time. Nobody's going to be saying, I don't believe that there is a God. You know, atheism is just about finished. It's kind of funny, you know, all these people, atheism is here, you know, to stay. No, it isn't. A couple of years from now, nobody's even going to be an atheist anymore. You know, and, and again, you know, read the, the book of Revelation. There's people that are still blaspheming God, even knowing that he exists. Why? The wicked shall do wickedly prophecy is being fulfilled so I just found that very interesting you know that that the day is dawning 
and because of that this, the light of Jesus Christ is approaching the earth right now and that's why there's such an explosion of truth and man I'll tell you what if you're watching these videos and you're still not saved you still haven't fixed up that relationship between you and the Lord you know through the person of Jesus Christ through what he did on the cross good night what are you waiting for well my friends and my family what are they gonna think who cares what they think man wake up <laughs> get saved don't fool around friend I mean you better get saved soon so let's close here with a word of prayer dear Heavenly Father I I do thank you so much for truth I thank you for your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth and I thank you for your word your written word Lord an actual physical connection that we have with with you and we can really truly understand what you want for us what you have planned for the future and I just pray Lord for the brothers and sisters out there that are saved I pray that they would be comforted knowing that you're going to take us away before your wrath is poured out and I just pray Lord uh, for those that are lost that they would get saved soon and that they wouldn't fool around any longer but that they would um, not care about what people think and just throw caution to the wind and, and get saved and uh, come to you Lord and, and understanding that they are sinners and that they cannot save themselves and that their faith needs to be put wholly in you and I just um, pray that you would help to keep all of us busy for you until the time comes when you catch us out of here. And I pray, Lord, that that time would come soon. And I ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, that's going to be it. Kind of an odd study today. But, uh, you know, uh, just doing a lot of other research right now. So it's kind of like a you know the sermon thing and, and I'm actually uh, getting ready to do some correspondence with a couple different um, people that have written books and things here and I'm gonna actually share that correspondence um, I've been doing some study into that and, and so like I said I always have about you know 10 or 12 different projects going at the same time um, so getting things together here um, but I just I just really felt a need to put this thing together here just to as a as another comfort to the the brethren Jesus is coming soon to get us out of this wicked place uh, there is a preacher of rapture definitely um, I just more and more I think about it and it's just like there is no other way it's incredible um, but I'm gonna quit uh, talking now uh, there was another point I was gonna try to make something else I was going to say about this whole thing um, about oh I know what it was okay I know what it was the Bible says in 1st Corinthians chapter 13 just read this quick 1st Corinthians chapter 13 verse 12 for now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. You know, and again, my wife and I were discussing this this morning. We were talking about it, and I said, you know, it's like right now, our physical connection to God, the only physical connection you have to God is right here. Okay, King James Bible. You can touch this book. You can read it. You can understand what God wants for you. It is a physical connection to God. He's written, he's given you written instructions and he put it right there for you okay so we have this physical connection to God but it's in writing well it's kinda of like in the past before video became available you had writing but you had to have a lot of faith you couldn't actually see like if I like you know we were talking I said about this guy that did the Lego Bible I said he's kinda of looks effeminate he's got blue hair well you can make a mental picture but you couldn't really see the guy and your chances of actually ever meeting the guy were not very good but now we have video so I can show you the guy's picture and just boom put it right up like that I can show you video of, of events and things like this and so we're moving from the word based culture of having to make mental pictures and having faith in certain things we're moving away from that now as a society as a world 
and we're moving now into sight. And I thought, isn't that interesting? It's actually kind of a mirror thing of, you know, our relationship as mankind down here with God. God's always dealt with us through written scriptures, but the time is coming, the revelation of Jesus Christ is just about here, where it's actually going to start to become sight. And that light is getting closer to the earth now, and so we're seeing elements of that truth now happening right before our eyes. These supernatural things. I mean, you can't explain all the 666 stuff. It's incredible. They're just putting it everywhere. And, and all this implantable microchip stuff and a RFID this and that. It's incredible. And all the other signs too. I mean, you, you know about it. Unreal. Absolutely unreal. Jesus Christ, the light. The day is dawning. We're moving into the day. And we're becoming more awake. While the lost world, those that do wickedly, and they love their wickedness, they have pleasure in unrighteousness, they're saying, hey, turn that light out. We like it dark. Pretty amazing. So we will see you. I'm not really sure what time I'm going to be coming out with another study or so here. I uh, just wanted to do this one really quickly here. A few other little projects to... to to do uh, of course we you know I'm trying to work on this place here um, there's been it's just a constant challenge uh, just things to do and, and everything so you know I'm balancing out working around this place and and, and um, I don't know if you can hear like a fan noise there in the background but right over that way there's a pellet stove that's how we're heating the place now so there's the constant thing of taking care of the stoves and you know getting bags of pellets and so all this stuff just kind of has to go together and and uh, you know that's uh, just bringing out studies and things like that. But um, hopefully now you've you have at least a little picture of how I put together sermons, how the way the thing works. Um, again, don't try to just be like, well, I got to do it Brian's way because he's you know the ultimate man of God or something like this. Don't ever think that, <laughs> you know. Do it the way the Lord tells you to do it. I mean, you can, you know, do it totally different than the way I do it. That's fine. You know, I'm just offering you a suggestion and what works for me and what how the Lord has done things for me through this um, particular technique that I use here. Uh, so I think I'm going to stop talking now, and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.